Hi there. So for this last part, um, we're going to have a look at rendering and yeah, some of the render settings that are in Corona, even though you don't really need to change a lot of them if you're just trying it out. Um, it's actually quite well optimized out of the box. I generally don't change that much. So uh, I've got this really basic scene. I'm going to hit render real quick and you can see we've got all kinds of things going on. Um, I've got all different kinds of materials and uh, yeah, we're going to have a look at that scene and there's a reason why I have all these different materials in there. So we can have a look at how it breaks down within the render and how we can get different passes out of it and things like that. And just a general overview of what the render settings are and where they are. So let's start with that. If I open it up, obviously we have our common settings which I'm going to skip over. Um, all I have to do is make sure you've got Corona Render assigned. And then we go to scene. Now scene, um, you'll probably be changing most of the things that you are will be changing in here. The other two won't really need too much changing, uh, changing about or messing about, especially if you just start using it. It's a great, great renderer to just pick up and really start using it uh, the moment you have it and not worry about settings too much. So let's have a look at the general settings. Um, there's a few things here that are important. Show virtual frame buffer. So you can show the last rendered frame. Um, now I've noticed as well is if you hit the good old rendered frame window, it will show you the older one, um, but you can see your frame just as well. So there's really no need to always go in unless you want to see all your passes and things like that. Or you prefer the Corona frame buffer um, for a quick preview to go in here. Now you can also start the interactive rendering. Um, I haven't really used that all that much yet, so I'm going to leave that aside. Uh, we're just going to focus on regular rendering for now. Then you've got an option to render only your elements. Um, and this is where it really gets interesting. So how does Corona work? Basically, it renders passes. If we hit render again, you'll see that it'll be really, really rough in the beginning. And then kind of gets a complete image and it just refines from there on. You'll see as well that it says passes total here. It's, it keeps going. So we're rendering our third pass now, fourth one, fifth one and so on and so forth. So it just keeps going. And as long as you leave your passes set to zero, it'll just keep going infinitely. As well as a time limit, um, as long as everything here is set to zero, it'll just keep going infinitely. And I've shown Corona to a few people and everybody's like, well, you know, how do you know when it's done? Well, basically, if it looks good, it's done. So what you could do is, you know, when I have to render a scene or whatever, I usually just Put, turn on the render um, and go have dinner or something. Just leave it for a while. Maybe check back every couple minutes or every 10 minutes or whatever. Um, and if you start noticing like, okay, we're at past 200 now or past 150 now, it actually looks really, really good. I'm gonna set it to maybe 125, let it render one, one full frame and then come back and see how it's done. And if it looks good, well, then that's it. Um, why would I use passes rather than time? Unless you're really, really strapped for time, you could use the time limit. But the thing is, sometimes you won't have the same amount of passes done in a different time. Maybe one frame is a lot more compu computationally intensive than the other. And um, it'll look different, like it'll there'll be less noise going in from one frame to another. While when you're using passes, you get the same amount of passes uh, over the scene. So you'll get the same amount of noise and it'll just look a lot better. Now, another really great feature of Corona is you can save your virtual frame buffer um, and then resume again from the file. So especially if you're rendering stills, let's say um, you want to render a really, really big frame uh, and you don't really have that much time. So you render like maybe 50 passes or 100 passes and then you have to send it to client or something like that. You can send it to them and tell them like, you know, this is still noisy, but um, if you like everything that's in there, then, you know, that's fine. And if they say, okay, this looks great, we want to have the full version, then you can just load in that file, the, um, the EXR you saved, and just resume from it. And that way, if you're, you'd been rendering for maybe an hour or two hours, you're going to save those two hours, which, which is a really, really great way to work. Um, it saves time, I mean, and that's what it's all about, right? So again, we have our last render here. So if I hit resume last render, which is basically the same as loading in a saved file, then you'll see basically it stays the same and it just keeps going from where it was, which is really, really nice. So 
Obviously, as long as nothing has changed in your scene. If you're going to do a different scene and load in a different EXR, then you're going to get weird results. So you have to make sure everything's the same, but I guess that speaks for itself. Then we've got some overrides here. The render hidden lights um, is an interest interesting one. Um, if you've got lights in your scene that are hidden, obviously you can turn it on and they will render. So I don't really use it that often, but it's nice that it's in there. The second one, the material override is really good for when you're kind of trying to get a scene, um, when you're trying to maybe debug a scene or whatever, just looking at if something's wrong or why it isn't rendering quick or something like that. You can turn on the material override, just throw a material in there and as we render, there we are, everything's gonna be that material. Now this is nothing new obviously if you've used different renderers, but I just wanna show you where you could find it. Then the exposure uh, and tone mapping is something I'm not gonna go over too much. Um, that's something you really kind of have to experiment with. It's good to know that if we render now, this one, uh, all these tone mapping controls that you find here, you can also find within your frame buffer. And if you can't see them, just hit tools and there they are. So, um, for now, this is disabled because I have a modifier on my camera. But um, yeah, it's good to know that if I change these, then they will also change within the render setup. So they're linked, so there's no worry, uh, no need to worry about maybe different values in different places, things like that. Then for the last tab, um, we're going to look at scene environment. I'm skipping over depth of field and motion blur here. Um, for the environment tab, we saw that in the HDRI part, so we could use um, the 3ds Max settings, or you could load it in here if you wanted to, or assign a color. And again, um, we have overrides, as in within other renderers, your direct visibility. So let's say you're using an HDR to light something, but you want a black background, then you can turn this on and just leave it empty and leave this to black, and so on and so forth. The global volume material is something I'm gonna turn on as well. This is empty by default. I'd already put one in here. Um, this is material which we hadn't talked about the in the material settings um, or in the material part of these tutorials. We have a Corona volume material and this is really made for volumetrics such as, you know, maybe smoke in your scene, something like that. Um, and turning this on, you can put this in the global volume material. You can also apply it to a uh, an object if you want to. But if we look at what we had before, and we render again now. Then you can see we actually have volumetrics going on in the scene. So we've got nice kind of hazy, smoky feel. Um, I threw a noise map in there as well just to have some variation. But that's what it does. It's a really quick and easy way to get volumetrics within your scene. Um, and I found that it works quite well, like it's not really that hard to tweak and you get there pretty quickly um, or at the result you want pretty quickly, so that's nice. And I cancel this for now and close this. Put this back. Open our render settings. Um, so another thing to note is if I press render again really quick, Max doesn't actually lock up. Um, we'll have a look in a minute at the option to do so, but it's really nice that you're still able to do things. Especially, let's say you have a render where you went a little nuts with the displacement settings or something like that, and you feel like um, it might crash or something. Corona runs the same way Mental Ray does, so it will crash on its own. Your Max won't crash. But having Max not lock up also gives you the option to still save your scene if you want to. So that's really nice. Now moving on, we've done most of these. Um, I'm going to look at the Performance tab. So standard basically you'll get your two solvers and um, this is where you're gonna say how Corona is basically rendering your entire scene so we've got path tracing we can set this to path tracing as well um, if you want to but the standard solver combination of path tracing and UHD cache is actually really really good I haven't found any reason to switch it thus far and not really too many reasons to go in here and change things. I mean, there's a few things that might be interesting uh, to look at, but you should only be really messing with them if you know what you're doing. So the couple of ones that might be important um, are the GI versus AA balance. So let's say you've got a scene with a lot of reflections and 
not really much indirect light, then you might want to change this a little bit. But again, you can tooltip over it and you get a, uh, a nice little explanation of what it does. Same with the maximum sample intensity. Let's say if you're getting a lot of fireflies and a lot of crazy, crazy over bright pixels, um, you could turn this down and see what it does. But so far, I haven't really found too much of a, um, yeah, of a reason to mess with it. Then the UHD cache doesn't have a lot of options because it doesn't really need to. Uh, I think I set this one's precision to two at some point, set it back to one. There's really no need to change it. Um, but the thing to note here though is if you're going to do animation, set it to flicker free rather than still frame, um, or animation, sorry, rather than still frame, and you'll get really nice flicker free uh, animation. So that's that for those. Then system, there's a couple things here which might be nice to know. Um, one of them I already talked about going into the material section. Uh, this is the custom previews which you can switch on or off and change your preview quality. So if we have a look at the materials as well, you get a like a custom preview. If we switch these off and update them, you get the standard 3ds Max one or the Corona one. Um, obviously you can use the one that you prefer. Setting this preview quality higher as well uh, will kind of slow it down, obviously, especially with a lot of materials, but you'll get a smoother result. So it's just a full version of Corona running within your material editor, um, which is really, really nice because you get a really accurate, accurate representation. Now this one is the render stamp. So um, I actually skipped over two of these, sorry about that. So you can export the scene to run in the Corona standalone application. Now I have it running on Mac, so I don't really see much reason to do so, but maybe people um, trying to render it out of out of Max uh, should have a look at that. And then with the system settings, low thread priority, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't really, as it says, it doesn't really affect um, the rendering performance, but your computer will be a little more responsive when you're rendering. So that's nice if you're trying to, you know, maybe quickly Google something uh, while you're rendering or something like that. Then this is something I had talked about earlier, the lock 3ds Max during render. So with it on, uh, with it off, I'm sorry, which is off by default, we can change it. Um, what happens is I can still manipulate you know, and open things within Max. So I can open my material editor, for example, I can open and close my render settings. Um, but yeah, this is different behavior than from most renderers. If you want it back the way uh, you're used to, if you're used to using like Ventoray or V-Ray, you can turn this on and then you'll see when we render, there's really not that much that we can do anymore. It just locks Max um, and that's it. So, but you don't have the option to save anymore during render, which I do like to have sometimes. I'm gonna turn this back off. Then the render stamp, which obviously is just the stamp at the bottom. So this is really nice for test renders if you wanna compare. Um, just turn it on and off. And there's a whole bunch of um, commands you put in there and you can actually see what's going on. Um, if you press a little, little question mark, you can actually get all the codes there and just do whatever you want. So, or you just reset it to the default one. Then um, this kind of maybe goes a little bit against me liking uh, to be able to save while I'm rendering. You can also enable an auto save, um, but this isn't really to auto save your scene. This is auto save your frame buffer. So why would this be handy? Well, if we go look at the scene settings and see that we can actually resume from a file, well, let's say your computer crashes halfway and let's say you have 500 passes or something crazy like that and just want to let it run and it crashes at 250 passes. Well, if you had your autosave enabled and it saves, you know, every 10 minutes or whatever and you've got different versions, you'd actually load that back up through the resume from file and just keep going. Uh, so that's a really nice little feature, um, which I don't really use that much because I haven't, it, it's been really stable for me. So I guess that's... Uh, that's good for, for the people that develop Corona, but it's nice to have it in there. So it's always good. Then the image filter, um, you can turn off anti-aliasing or filtering completely, or you can switch between box scent and Gaussian. I found the de default of 10 to work quite well. Um, yeah, obviously, as it says here, it's the most reliable. It produces the most, uh, most consistent results across all kinds of scenes. So it's really nice to use. Um, 
and that's why I leave it at that. Then you can choose between the Corona frame buffer, none or the um, native 3ds Max frame buffer. Like I just like to use the Corona one. Get all these really nerdy stats you can look at as well, and you can color map it too. So that's always nice, and you get to turn off those tools if you don't want to see them. So. Then um, the next bit is about your license, obviously. Uh, but you know, if you bought it, you can just see it's licensed. That's it. If you didn't and you're still using a trial, um, which you should definitely check out if you're wondering about it. I mean, you get 45 days uh, fully unlimited trial, so you can do whatever you want with it, which is pretty pretty amazing, to be completely honest. Um, compared to some of the other. Um, competitors out there that's a really really nice deal to go and have a look at it and and just see what it's all about then this last one uh, the distributed rendering before we move on to the render elements is pretty cool I mean distributed rendering I don't have my machines turned on at the moment but it's really really easy to use you have um, a little exe that you have to run on the computers just to uh, enable the distributed rendering on them and then you can just search your LAN and they'll pop up really quickly and you can also have um, Corona search LAN during the render so let's say you start rendering and dis distributed rendering is enabled and you turn on a second computer as it's rendering as long as this is enabled as well it'll keep looking for um, hosts on your network so it'll automatically add them as well and it really does make a pretty big difference and then for the last one we'll quickly have a look at render elements as well um, so far the only two things that are in their standard is beauty and alpha now before I hit render um, I'm gonna add a couple of elements in and this is really nice as well. You get a few of them that are named C Essential. And basically these uh, seven render elements are the ones you're gonna need to completely bring your scene back in compositing. So if you just wanna split it up into all the different layers, Corona has seven different layers uh, by default in your Essential Passes. So C Essential, everything that's there uh, are the ones that you're gonna need for your scene. Now I'm gonna add in a Z depth as well and the albedo pass as well which is really nice so let's have a look at the z depth one um, i'm going to set the maximum z a little higher just because i know the scene is a little bigger and we're going to press render real quick and see what happens now i've obviously got this stamp still enabled as well so um, that'll shine through on your renders. You might, you'll might, you obviously want to disable that again uh, for your final render. So having a look at the different types of passes that we have available to us now, we've got our direct lighting, we've got our indirect lighting, we've got emission, which are two um, teapots I have here with, with the Corona light material. We've got our reflections, we've got our refractions, we've got translucency, which is a plane here in the back, and we've got volumetrics as well, and that's what I was talking about earlier. I threw in a noise map so you can see that the volumetrics are actually being affected by it as well. Then we have a depth pass. Um, I think the depth pass here is still set to, 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 to enable filtering. So uh, if you want to use it in uh, to actually get depth, um, sorry, to actually change your depth of field and get like different focal effects then you're going to want to disable the filtering obviously and the last one the C shading albedo is a really interesting pass so albedo is also um, a term for I guess your diffuse uh, the diffuse portion of your um, of your material actually that's not completely correct it's the term for the amount of light that's being reflected again off your material so what does this mean exactly? This pass is actually a really, really good pass to see if your um, all your materials are optimized. What do I mean by this? If I just stop rendering really quickly, I'm gonna throw in uh, an override material into our uh, override here. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a separate one and give it 100% white as a, there we go, as a diffuse. If we render again now, it's still on the albedo map, what you'll see is that everything becomes red. Now why does it all become red? Basically because if you exceed uh, a certain number of, a certain brightness within your shader, 
um, the Albedo Pass will be able to tell you like, well, I'm really having to calculate a lot here, and it's generally not really worth it. What I mean by this is if I turn my diffuse back down to say 200 and re-render this, then everything will still look white. But if we look at our albedo pass, we have gray now instead of red. So anything that's going into the red, you might want to have a look at to see if you can optimize the shader. Um, having a look at if it's too bright, maybe the diffuse color is too bright, maybe it's reflecting too much, things like that. Um, and bringing it down will improve your render speed, basically. Um, it'll make your scene look a little better sometimes. Um, not always, but it will definitely improve your render speed as well. So that's a really nice pass to have to kind of debug your scene. Now, other re render elements that are included um, are a bunch of stuff for normals and UVWs. Uh, if you really get into compositing, it's nice to have those. Another one that I'd like to highlight is the mask. So um, it's done in a really simple and elegant way. Uh, sorry, let's bring this back up. And I'm going to turn off the override as well. There's no need for my materials. Where are we? There we are. Um, you can actually have different kinds of masks uh, running through each other. So you could either have a monochrome mask uh, with just a um, object buffer in it. So let's say I'm going to set this one to object ID 1, set this one to object ID 2, and maybe have a look at our materials. Where are we? Get these blue teapots. There should be more than one in there. Actually, let's not do that. Let's get the green glass ones. It's going to get a little messy now. And give these maybe a material ID of 1. So what the um, mask actually allows us to do is, let's say we've got uh, our object ID here. I'm going to set it to 1. That was our big red pot in the middle. And this is a monochrome mask. So if we render it now and we go to our mask, we'll just get a really, really basic mask from um, our red teapot. So that's nice. There we go. But what if what if we have multiple things um, yeah, running through each other? So we can actually set this to material ID one as well, which were the green glass ones in the back. So you get the same effect. So you can either choose between uh, object IDs or material IDs, or you can mix them as well, which is nice too. Or you can select a bunch of, um, yeah, a bunch of objects from a list, which is cool too. So when we switch to RGB mode, let's say we want red for the first teapot, we want green for the second one here that we gave ID number two, uh, object ID number two, and for the blue, we actually want to use material IDs and set that to one as well. And if we render it now, we'll see that we get completely different masks, either based on material, as the blue ones, or based on the object ID, um, as per the other ones. The other thing we could do as well is, oh, I don't really need the material one. Let's say we turn that off and we select, uh, which one is this, teapot number one. We just select the one. Again, we get the mask as we need it. So we've got a whole lot of options here, um, which is really, really nice. And I found that compositing these passes um, is, just works so, so well. Uh, the way they've named them and grouped them is really, really nice, uh, especially for people that are still wanting to get into compositing or haven't done that much yet. This is a really, really great way to get into it. And that's a really quick overview of how rendering works in Corona. Um, again, there's not really that many render settings you have to change to get started. And I think that's really a plus. I mean, I love tinkering with things uh, and getting to know render engines, but with Corona, it's just been kind of fun because you can just jump in and, and start. And yeah, I mean, I love it. So that's why I decided to make these videos about it as well. Um, so yeah, if you want to check out Corona, they have a fully functional trial for 45 days with no limitations. And also, if you want to use an older version, uh, one of the alpha versions, alpha version 6 actually will remain free forever. Um, and it's compatible up to max 2014. So definitely have a look at it. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, just feel free to let me know and uh, I'll help out where I can. All right, thanks for sticking with me through these three tutorials. I know they were pretty long. 
Um, and I know it can be kind of all over the place sometimes, I, definitely because I do these off the top of my head as well. I hope you really enjoyed them, and um, yeah, have fun with Corona, and I'll see you next time.